Hola, hola. Uh, bienvenidos a todos. Uh, yo soy Tamara, trabajo para Lab Ciudades de la División de Desarrollo Urbano y Vivienda en Washington. Yo voy a introducir a um, los dos conferencistas que tenemos acá de presencia internacional hoy. Um, y um, empiezo a introducir a Jessica Zimbabue, um, que es la directora de Desarrollo Urbano en la Liga Nacional de Ciudades y directora ejecutiva fundadora del Centro Daniel Rose para el Liderazgo Público, una asociación de la Liga Nacional de Ciudades y el Urban Land Institute. Um, el programa emblemático del centro es la beca Daniel Rose para líderes públicos, que reúne a los alcaldes y equipos liderazgo senior de cuatro ciudades um, para un programa de aprendizaje de expertos en uso del suelo de un año de duración, um, asistencia técnica Uh, viajes de estudio, desarrollo de liderazgo y intercambio entre iguales. Um, anteriormente, uh, Chess fue directora del Instituto de Alcaldes sobre el diseño de la ciudad. Durante su estancia en el Instituto de Alcaldes, también se desempeñó como vicepresidenta de programas en el, la American Architectural Foundation, supervisando um, el programa de grandes escuelas por diseño de esa organización y desarrollando la Academia de Diseño de Ciudades Sostenibles. Um, antes de eso, Chess se desempeñó como directora de diseño comunitario en Urban Ecology, brindando planificación comunitaria pro bono y asistencia de diseño a vecindarios de bajos ingresos en el área de la Bahía de San Francisco. Um, Chess es miembro de la Facultad de Planificación Urbana de la Universidad de Georgetown. Um, obtuvo una maestría en arquitectura y una maestría en planificación urbana de UC Berkeley y el grado de arquitecto en la Universidad de Columbia. Chas fue becaria de política urbana y regional en el Sherman Marshall Fund y becaria del Instituto de Políticas de Mujeres de la Fundación de Mujeres de California. Se desempeñó um, de 2012 a 2017 como presidenta de la Junta de Directores de Next City y una designación de la alcaldía como miembro del Consejo Asesor en Green Buildings de Washington, D.C. Um, está certificada como arquitecta y como urbanista. Además, es una uh, profesional acreditada de LEED. Um, un gran currículo que <ríe> estaba introduciendo. Aquí pido a Chess de presentarnos um, su presentación. Obviamente vamos a cambiar a, a inglés ahora, pero creo que todos tienen um, la traducción. Entonces, Chess, por favor. Good morning, everyone, and I apologize for bringing English to you uh, first thing in the morning, and please bear with me. Uh, the other thing that I'll say is that native speakers of English often think that I speak quickly, so if you're trying to listen to English and I speed up or go too fast, feel free to raise your hand to remind me to slow down. <laughs> I will not be offended. <laughs> so good morning. It's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, this is such an important topic of conversation, and it's such an honor to be here with esteemed colleagues from the DR and, uh, and, and the US and other countries, it's a really important conversation. So as mentioned in the introduction, I run a program called the Rose Center for Public Leadership. That's a partnership between two uh, non NGO organizations. So the Rose Center was founded by this man, Daniel Rose, who is a real estate developer in New York. And Mr. Rose uh, founded the center because looking back on his long and successful career in real estate, he realized that as a private sector real estate developer, that career was only made possible, those projects were only possible because of the sophistication of the, the partners that he had in the cities where he was building. That that pub public-private partnership was so important and that too often in real estate, the public and the private conversation is set up as antagonistic. The private sector is proposing something and the, the city asks questions, makes demands for changes, and there's uh, you know, a chance to approve or deny a permit, but not really enough conversation between the two sectors, the public and the private, about a better future for cities. So he wanted to create a space for that conversation. So that's a lot of what we do. 
So as I mentioned, we're, we operate as a partnership between two NGO organizations, both nonprofits based in Washington. The National League of Cities is an association of local governments, the largest association of local governments in the United States. Uh, we act as a resource and an advocate on behalf of 17,000 cities, towns, and villages around the United States. And the other organization is the Urban Land Institute, which is um, a private membership NGO that's supported by 40,000 individuals who work in real estate and design and law and accountancy in all the fields that do urban development. And they come together around a mission of the responsible use of land and sustaining thriving communities. So we do a lot of programs at the Rose Center to bring those two sectors together, forums, conversations about public shared topics between, of interest between the public and the private sector, and education for public officials about how real estate finance works and how they can better leverage their leadership to create better real estate development. As was also mentioned in the introduction, the flagship program is called the Daniel Rose Fellowship. We coach intensively for a year for mayors about land use and about a land use development challenge in their city um, in a year long program. And this is a photograph from when we did work with the mayor of Honolulu, who's there in yellow in Hawaii. And I use this photograph as a reminder that even in, in paradise like Hawaii, the public sector meeting rooms are awful and have no natural light and, and are depressing. Um, but the, the program brings together the mayor and the mayor's senior team for a year long program of peer exchange and development there. So these are some of the cities that we've worked with in the first nine years of the program, most of the largest cities in the US. Currently, we have a class of four cities, which are Columbus, Ohio, Richmond, Virginia, Salt Lake City, Utah, and Tucson, Arizona. And we do this work because I think cities are the most sustainable thing that we have invented as a species. And I really believe in the capacity of public sector leaders to use the, the sort of bully pulpit of their office to bring about a better conversation about a shared future of cities. So often when we work with cities, um, I'm gonna go over an example. Here's the kind of problem that the city will bring to us. We worked with the city of Detroit a couple of years ago. And the city of Detroit was looking at this corridor, a street that runs about two miles long through the city that's called Livernoy Avenue that was historically a great street, but like many parts of Detroit, has fallen on tougher times. And so we spent a year coaching um, the mayor and the team about how to rethink the development of this street. And I wanna present it in this conversation because I know we're talking about smart cities and big data, and I believe in those things too, but I wanna present this case study a little bit to problematize or to set up some questions for my colleagues about some challenges that are hard to bring data into the decision-making process for. Because in our work, we're working with especially elected officials. They're very concerned um, about the, the sort of the public face of, of a problem and how to convince the skeptical members of a public to go a certain direction. And sometimes they, they are more comfortable in the sort of storytelling modes and in the interpersonal connections that got them elected. They're using the sort of charismatic power of their persona rather than leaning hard on data to demonstrate why they are making a decision. And that I also think that it's challenging in some areas of a city that are not the downtown, that are not the place that's getting the most development because there's less data available. It's not as strongly suited as the downtown, the center city where the, the most of the employment and the investment is. So I'll present this one as a, a case study of some of the work that we do and then I hope that we can have a bigger conversation about how to bring um, more concrete data decision making into concert with these other kinds of leadership like we coached the mayor of Detroit through. So Livernoy is there in the top middle, the yellow area um, that's called Livernoy McDickles. Those are the two streets that intersect and the, the area around it is the neighborhood. And so you can see that it's outside of the center of Detroit, which is there on the river. But historically, it was a very grand, fashionable avenue. It was known as the Avenue of Fashion. So in the 1950s, this is the area in Detroit where people would come to go out. On a Friday or Saturday night, people would cruise up and down the street in their fancy automobiles with the windows down to talk to each other, and people would dress in their fine clothes to walk and go shopping on Livernoy. And today, 
Uh, it's not that. It's fallen a far ways from that, like much of the city of Detroit. So the homes around the Livernoy Corridor are very beautiful. This is in the winter in Detroit. They have lots of snow, but you can still see the homes are beautiful. Um, very fashionable brick Tudor mansions that any of us would be proud to live in. These are beautiful homes in a beautiful, stable neighborhood. But the commercial corridor of Livernoy is very different from what it once was. So there are old businesses like Baker's Jazz Lounge, which is where all of the famous jazz musicians came through and played, but has been in and out of closure several times in the last 10 years. Has closed for a year, somebody finds some money to reopen it, closes again for a little bit, somebody else tries to reopen it. So it's really at risk uh, as term in terms of a neighborhood institution. And you can see here that even the newer types of retail um, are still very much set back from the street with parking in front. They're not contributing to a very active, nice, walkable city environment. There have been some limited beautification projects. Here behind the speaker is a mural painted on the side of a building. Some new businesses opening. Here's an entrepreneur who's just opened the first sit-down restaurant that had opened on the corridor for about 10 years when he opened it. Some new businesses going into the neighborhood. Some nice buildings that do front the street, still from the old, when it was the neighborhood Main Street. Um, but the facades have been, you can see on the Foot Locker building, there's a big roll down security door that closes it. So it's not, it's giving a message that's different than what it was historically. It's giving a message of insecurity and not a nice place to be. And somewhat outdated signs, right? The, the wig sign here has not been updated for some time. There's security fencing. So it's sending a different message than this, when this was a grand shopping street in Detroit. The trees are a bit of a mixed bag. Some people like the greenery. They protect the pedestrians on the sidewalk. But the business owners have a big problem with the trees because it blocks the signs. So people can't see their business. There's a median in the middle of the street, here covered in snow, because it was February, I think, when I took this photo. But um, it makes it difficult because it makes it harder to even cross the street. If you wanted to shop from one side of the street to the other, this widened the street and made it even more difficult to, to make a crossing between the two sides. There's somewhat poor pedestrian space. These are huge crosswalks um, with not much protecting them, and you can see the McDonald's and other businesses that are set back from the street, so it's a long ways to cross, not a pleasant walking environment. There's a major university, the University of Detroit Mercy, that's on the corridor, um, and that's what the big building here is on the campus. So you can see that big fence disconnecting the campus from the community. The fence was built in the 1960s when they were worried about safety and security of their students. But now the campus is very much an island. You know, not many points of access out to the neighborhood, very internalized. And so the students don't go, for instance, just across the street to shop or have lunch on the corridor. And then you know, this is a, the small shelter there in the middle is a bus shelter where people wait for the bus. Um, and pretty uncomfortable. This is very cold weather. Uh, and so to wait in that bus shelter with no heat in the middle of February is an unpleasant sort of environment where you're cut off from everything by that fence of the campus. Very auto-dominated landscape, but also many of the businesses are servicing cars, so cars coming in and out in all directions, making it even more sort of visually unpleasant and difficult for pedestrians. Um, <laughs> this is a word that one of the architects we used, the iffy, is a, it's a very slang word, but like a little bit questionable, the building here, right? So this is a, a pawn shop where people would trade jewelry they have or leave it on layaway, hoping that they would come back and buy it. But so, you know, uh, clearly a bit of a visual eyesore and sending a certain message about what new investment might look like in this neighborhood. And a lot of vacant buildings, even at the main intersection of Livernoy and McNichols, which is sort of the main uh, downtown crossing of this area. So we did some urban design analysis of the corridor. There you see Livernoy running north-south. So the yellow line traces the, the, the land plots that are directly facing onto the corridor. And they're very shallow. So they don't have a lot of space to, to work with in terms of moving the parking behind or doing much else uh, in terms of the design of the lot, except for those few on the one side that are wider. It's a very narrow corridor in terms of the land lots. And on either side, it very quickly, as you can see, becomes single family homes in the neighborhood around on either side. 
So the recommendations that we gave when we were working, coaching the mayor and working with the city, there were six recommendations. One was to address the parking needs of the business owners there. Two, to focus on creating particular nodes that this is, a, like I said, a two mile long strip and you can't, simply can't do public investment along the whole two mile strip uh, all at once. You have to focus on some areas where you can so, see a more intense investment so that people can see the turnaround in those particular nodes. The third was change by design, which was a set of recommendations about designing the individual lots along um, the corridor that you saw that in terms of being able to buy maybe a couple vacant parcels behind them. The fourth was about marketing and branding and what the city can do. The fifth was about building capacity of the citizen groups and neighborhood groups in the area. And the sixth was about activating government. This was a very challenging time for the city of Detroit. You may have heard of Detroit and it's mostly not nice things that are said about Detroit. It's sort of the butt of a lot of jokes, right? I grew up in Flint, Michigan, so I grew up near Detroit and I know what the sort of outside impression of Detroit is. And mo much of it is true or based in truth. Detroit fell on really hard times. This work we did was shortly after the last recession. And so the city government in Detroit was literally focused on um, buildings that were br burning down, vacant homes that were being set on fire uh, for insurance purposes or other reasons in some neighborhoods of the city, in the very poorest neighborhoods of the city. So the city government literally putting out fires and having to work on much more urgent problems. But we said to them, you have to, in addition to solving the worst of the problems, put some focus on some of the areas that are doing okay, that some of the nice residential neighborhoods like this, because this is the only thing that's gonna keep people in the city. If there, if there aren't play, neighborhoods like this where people would choose to live, and if you don't work on improving those too, then there's nothing to keep the people who are living in these handsome homes there. So these are the recommendations that we gave them. And so then they have been working on them for a couple of years. So they, the city formed a corridor working group with neighborhood residents and leaders and nonprofits to work on storefronts, murals. They formed an arts council. They worked on a website and social media. They implemented business incentives and tools. They got a streetscape design contract. And then we also brokered a meeting with the new president of the university, the University of Detroit Mercy, with the mayor to help them come to a different agreement about the role the university could play in the neighborhood. And what we said to the university president was basically, look, every prospective student with their parents who comes to visit the university comes along this corridor. That's how they enter your campus. And so is this the front door approach that you want prospective parents and students to see? And if it's not, then what role can the university play in partnering with the city to improve it and make it a more welcoming place? So then these are the zones of the focus area for the city. Again, Livernoy there at the top in yellow. And so they started working based on our advice with the citizens. So they had a series of community meetings, here they are over the course of one year, to work with neighborhood residents to identify what nodes they should focus on, what the, should the priority projects be. But then the challenge of when you do this much engagement, which is great, I, I believe in citizen engagement and planning, but these are a lot of events in a short period of time. And when you're doing this kind of much engagement, which makes political sense, then you have to also show that you're making progress because if you just have meetings and get input and have meetings and get input and nothing changes, then people lose trust in the institution of the government to implement anything. So they quickly turned a lot of these ideas that they got in these meetings into pilot projects and quick turnaround projects. So they got a streetscape improvement grants that here would change the crosswalks you see in the blue in the middle to change that median, that big grassy sort of landscape median in the middle to make it more of a pedestrian plaza that's safer in the middle and to add some signage, some furniture, plantings to make it a more pleasant place to walk and be. And even before they got the full funding from the state to do the actual implementation and construction, they did what's called a pop-up of some of the um, some of the ideas of traffic calming. So you can see on the side of the road, they just literally put paint down and um, little plastic bollards to change the lanes and where the cars could go and where parking was and where crosswalks were with just paint and some plastic bollards. But even with just paint and plastic bollards, so very low budget, 
they found that 77% of people in the neighborhood noticed less speeding of cars during that traffic period. So that um, showed them that it was worthwhile to continue with this project and help them actually get the funding moved up in priority to physically do them in actual concrete. So this is the old streetscape. You can see that grassy median in the middle and the cars on the side. And the new streetscape eliminates the median and widens the sidewalks on both sides. So there's another row of trees. So it's a much more pleasant pedestrian environment, almost like a linear park or walking environment on both sides of the street, taking the space from that median. And so this is a before photograph. And here's a rendering, and I'll talk about back and forth between the two, of what they're implementing now. They're building, it's under construction. So much more space for a bicycle lane, for landscaping, for cafes and seating, and activity basically on the sidewalk. Then the other thing that they've had a lot of success with, again, this term pop-up is a very common one now to talk about in a lot of cities for sort of temporary low budget usage. So those were pop-up, when it was just paint and cones on the street, that was a pop-up streetscape. This is pop-up retail, which is when they have vacant storefronts, which there were many of on Livernois, then to locate temporarily a, a short-term business for three months, six months, one year, to just to activate the street fund, not a permanent business that might pay rent for a long time, but the city then decided to subsidize some rents on a short-term basis to do pop-up shops for events and artists and small businesses on the corridor. And so this was the first one they did. They called it the Livernois storefront. And the space would hold events in the evening, musicians, artist performances. They had a marketplace during the day where they would sell goods that were made locally in the neighborhood and works of local artists. And so it drew a lot of activity. And so the city paid for the rent on this space, I think initially for one year and then for another year because it was so successful um, before they had a full business model that could pay the rent. The city was subsidizing it, but you can see the amount of activity that's very different than when this was a boarded up storefront, right, that's being brought to the neighborhood. And so as a result of, you know, a few years of dedicated effort to work with the community to show quick wins and then to show that the value of the longer term win, now, five years later, after the initial work, the city is starting to see private investment. So the market is responding. The city no longer has to invest public taxpayer dollars the market is responding with private investment, and here's a brand new development going on that main corridor where the boarded up gray, uh, gray vacant building was. And so I think it's taken dedicated leadership by the mayor and several people around the mayor, a lot of sustained community engagement and conversation with the neighborhood, who was skeptical of the city's ability to deliver anything to their neighborhood, but now it's turning around. And so I wanna present sort of three challenges that I think this case study and others yield to the idea of data-driven leadership, because I believe in it and we talk about it a lot, the importance of data and making decisions around data. But I think in this case, there were three challenges. One is the scarcity of market data on neighborhoods outside of downtown. Most uh, retailers and commercial market brokers, office brokers, have data that's mostly for the central business district of a city. And that's where they know the per square foot rentage and the cap rates. And most of that data does not apply outside of the, the downtown. So it's really difficult to show to a potential retail tenant or an office or an investor, you know, how many people are going to see a particular site or how many people might be potential customers for something outside of that downtown location. And we've tried to work with a number of um, local nonprofits, but it's very localized data because Often these nonprofits go out and literally collect, stand on the street corner and count how many cars, how many people are going by because those counts are not included in the sort of national, when they show city of Detroit numbers, they're mostly showing downtown city of Detroit numbers. So to get data about another neighborhood can be a challenge. I think the check second challenge is that politicians, because of how they get elected and what we expect of the persona of an elected official, tend towards a more qualitative storytelling. They, they stand up and tell a story about a 
small business owner and point her out in the audience and oh, I was so excited to see Maria and her shop open and that that's sort of a, a, something that falls more naturally to them rather than making an analytical decision based on data. So often the technocrats who work in the city use data, but when it comes to the politician having to convince people to go a different direction, that could be a challenging interface between the technocrats and the politicians. And then I think the third thing that's a challenge here was that you saw um, the idea of the pilot streetscape and the pop-up storefront, that it's hard to make things palpable just as numbers, especially for citizens in a neighborhood that don't have any expertise in urban planning, urban development. When you show a rendering, or more importantly show through a temporary pop-up, it fe feels very real. Um, and it feels palpable, and they can imagine it in their head. Whereas when you just start showing data, it can be hard for them to analyze what the potential changes are. So with that, I hope that I'll um, invite my colleague up and that we can have a, a bit of a conversation. I think we'll save questions to the end for both. Does that make sense? Yeah? Very good. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Jessica. I think a uh, very interesting case study um, also for here, for uh, Dominican Republic. So yeah, now um, I would uh, like to invite uh, Masoud um, Gandehari, uh, and then we will have a, a round of questions on, on both uh, presentations and a, a little discussion. Um, so um, I will um, introduce uh, Masoud Gandehari, um, I will switch to Spanish now. <laughs> Masoud um, es profesor de la Facultad de Ingeniería Civil y Urbana de la Escuela de Ingeniería de la Universidad de Nueva York. Um, antes fue investigador en el Centro de Materiales Avanzados de la Fundación Nacional de Ciencias y en el Centro de Ingeniería de Calidad y Prevención de Fallas. Um, hizo su trabajo de posgrado en McGill University y Northwestern University con una tesis doctoral en metrología óptica de campo completo para la localización de daños por imágenes. Su investigación académica se ha centrado en la aplicación de instrumentación avanzada y análisis de datos dirigidos al envejecimiento, la salud y el rendimiento de los sistemas físicos a través de la aplicación de sensores, observaciones y evaluación de sistemas, está desarrollando metodologías que generan datos a gran escala sobre sistemas físicos, ambientales y humanos. Este trabajo tiene como objetivo desarrollar nuevos enfoques para comprender la condición, las interdependencias y el bienestar de las ciudades y sus habitantes. Los fondos para sus investigaciones provienen de la Fundación Nacional de Ciencia, el Departamento de Transporte, la Industria y varias agencias internacionales. El profesor Gandhiari es el investigador fundador del Instituto de Resiliencia del Estado de Nueva York para eventos de tormentas y fundador de Chrome Sense LLC, que cuenta con el apoyo de los Institutos Nacionales de Salud para la Innovación en Detección Ambiental. Además, está adscrito al Centro para Ciencia Urbana y Progreso de dicha universidad. Um, invito a Gandhiari. Thank you very much for the introduction. Sorry about the long, uh, long-winded uh, verbiage on that. Um, so thank you very much for the invitation to your beautiful city. Um, I've certainly enjoyed the, the few days that I've been here so far. And um, I can share with you some of my experience um, um, in this area, working uh, at uh, the university, New York University, where I've been for approximately 18 years. Um, so NYU is, um, is a medium-sized US university, 50,000 students altogether, uh, including uh, two uh, global campuses, one in Shanghai and one in Abu Dhabi each approximately 2,000 students. And uh, we have uh, seven study abroad sites, uh, um, five of them in Europe, one in Africa, and one in South America. 
And these study abroad sites are locations where students from our three campuses, meaning New York, Abu Dhabi, and Shanghai, can spend one semester during their four-year undergraduate program, um, uh, you know, gaining experience uh, uh, in, in other parts of the world. So, so the question uh, of, uh, um, y you know, why, why we, do, we, do, we do all this stuff uh, with, with, um, with, with cities. Um, um, so I suppose, um, uh, you, you know, I have been studying this sort of urban, urban um, um, science for approximately, uh, I would say, uh, seven, eight years. Uh, before that, as introduction mentioned, I was mostly in the physical sciences. I studied the metrology and optics and those kind of things. And it's not that uh, I was late. I think it's a new science. It's, it's a new field of studies. Um, as, a, as a matter of fact, it was the National Academies that uh, um, approximately 10 years ago made people aware of this big emergence, uh, emergence of cities. And it was from there that the US academic uh, institutions uh, decided to take it on as a, as a new thing, as a new discipline, or as a new focus area, as a new theme to pursue in their academic uh, life. Um, and, uh, and, and, and in a way, rightly so, uh, and, and a lot of this data actually had emerged uh, from some of the uh, global uh, agencies, such as the UN and UNESCO. Uh, this is uh, an interesting rend uh, rendering. Uh, I'm sorry if the, if the uh, um, colors are not coming through, but uh, this, this uh, is a map showing uh, the Americas and the Europe and Asia. Um, I, I'm sorry that the, that the, that the colors are not uh, coming through. Good. It's okay? Yeah. All right. Um, but basically the purple color, um, so, so what, what we're showing here, with div uh, uh, the UNESCO divided the, the world's uh, cities, uh, and they considered cities anything over 100,000 people. Uh, they divided uh, the, them into those cities that have, uh, those countries that have greater than 75% uh, city population, urban population, like highly urbanized. And those uh, purple color are, you see there is, um, there's not that many of them. I don't know, I mean, I must be colorblind because the colors are not coming through very well, but there were just a few uh, purple ones. Um, and then uh, there were those uh, countries that were between 50 and 75 in the yellow, and then in the blue uh, between 25 and 50, and so on and so forth for the green. Now, what happens is that in, um, uh, and incidentally, the size of these uh, circles represent to scale uh, the urban population in each of those countries, okay? So in other words, uh, you see that, uh, you know, uh, US, for example, has, is highly urbanized, uh, but it is not 75 and above, it's really between 50 and 75% urbanized, but it's quite a large population because US is a big city. I mean, it's a big, big country. But then what happens is that in 2010, a lot of, essentially the entire Americas became uh, majority urbanized, meaning over 50% urbanized, okay? And uh, some of the big boys uh, here be uh, changed. Um, and uh, they became over 25%, and most of Europe became uh, majority urban. So at the moment, 2012, more than half of the world's population lives in cities, and that's a statistics that gets reported frequently. Now, the expectation in 20 years, uh, I hope your eyes are better than my eyes in distinguishing, but basically the world's urban population uh, will be 75% uh, urbanized. And so, uh, as Dr. Gomez, um, you know, highlighted earlier, uh, the, the, the reasons why would one would want to pursue urban studies, uh, there are certainly ample reasons why you would want to do that. So, um, if, 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 if one was to look at uh, uh, some of uh, the, the, um, the patterns that you would see um, in, in, in uh, urban growth, uh, you, you, you notice that uh, while, this is an interesting um, plot actually, it shows size of the city, uh, greater the bigger this way, and growth rate. So it shows that smaller cities are growing faster than big cities, it kind of makes sense. Basically small cities are growing at approximately 4% or so per year, 
where the larger cities are growing at approximately one person per year, largely because there's more space and so on and so forth, and uh, there's many other reasons for it. Um, now, when it comes to, here's um, uh, the same nightlight uh, satellite imagery of, of cities, I thought it's, uh, it's an interesting systems way of looking at, at, at the whole picture. In this case, in the US, you see how the Eastern Corridor, uh, Boston and New York and Philadelphia and, and, and Baltimore and, and Washington are lined up. And then you see Chicago and, 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 and Cleveland and Detroit and uh, Atlanta and so on and so forth. Um, uh, and so, and, and of course there's many, many smaller ones that, that are growing, uh, continuously growing. Um, I'm sorry, I'm just checking my time. Good. Um, so, so, so what has happened is that uh, the, the growth is good, I suppose. Uh, I mean, you know, everybody, uh, most people benefit from this growth. Um, um, and as a matter of fact, my own university was one of those entities that benefited a lot from this urban growth. Uh, NYU was really not a very famous university in the 1970s. Uh, you really had to convince a student to go to NYU back then. At the moment, uh, we have 36 Nobel Prize winners, uh, um, uh, 17 uh, Pulitzer Prize winners, and it had to do with the amount of money that came into New York and, and, and sort of made the university also be a benefactor uh, from that growth. Um, so, um, so the, however, not everybody benefits from it. Uh, I am sure I've done a little bit of uh, uh, research while I've been here in Santo Domingo, and it, and it is pretty much the same as New York, that people can no longer afford living in, in Santo Domingo or in New York. <laughs> well, people, um, there's plenty of people there, but many of the people, many of the indigenous people who actually grew up and were raised in these big cities can no longer live where they lived when they were born or grew up. And so these are certainly some of the concerns that needs to be addressed, and perhaps through the engineering of these cities, easy access, quality of life, managing traffic. These are, I think, important questions that needs to be addressed in order to make that equity piece uh, of access and, and, and sort of quality of life for everyone um, uh, you know, achievable. Um, so, um, you know, th there are, and, 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 and I'd like to point to this question of partnerships because um, as Jess pointed out, it's, it's really, um, it takes more than just a city government. It takes more than just the uh, private sector. It takes more than just the academia. And so I just like to kind of, as we say, come back to the title uh, that, uh, that Eileen asked me to, to discuss or to, to present to you here, is that what is the role of the university in this uh, sort of uh, smart cities thing that, uh, that we are, uh, that we're all, uh, you know, congregating around here. So, um, so, so I'll just present to you our approach, and our approach is, is not necessarily unique. There are many other institutions who follow the same approach, okay? Um, and, and number one is um, initiatives across the university that address urban studies. So we're talking about School of Economics, School of Public Policy, School of Finance, School of Law, Schools of Engineering. So every one of these schools, so the university as a whole has taken on urban studies as a priority. Okay, so so it, it, it required the university leadership to, con to call urban studies as a priority, as an institutional priority, which means hiring people, providing scholarships. Those are things that were really put on the table. Um, and so on the programmatic scale level, meaning on a specific uh, level is, for example, where I work, I work uh, at the Center for Urban Science and Progress. And that's an institution that, uh, um, I mean, some consider it the premier urban studies center in the world. Uh, we have people coming from all over the world, funded by their own governments to come and work. And part of the reason for that is the institutional framework that enabled multidisciplinary research in the urban science that I'm just referring to. So I think that is really probably the, one of the most important things that, that people from the arts, people from the finance department, economics, public policy, engineering, 
planning, architecture. They work together in order to, in a way, learn from each other. I teach a class uh, uh, in, in, in this uh, center, and uh, as a matter of fact, many of the slides that I'm going to be showing you are homeworks from my students, so I'm just stealing, uh, in a way, uh, shamelessly from, from some of those, uh, some of those um, homeworks. Um, so, I, I, and, and I'd like to, 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 to make one final point uh, on this, and that's the stakeholder engagement. Early, and, and, and I'm, uh, I'm sorry about some of the, some of the uh, uh, misspellings here, but um, stakeholder engagement early in the process. And what I mean barely in the process means in the education piece of this thing, okay? So we offer, uh, of course, doctorate, masters, a variety of degrees, but there is a very specific program uh, called urban informatics, which is not just big data stuff, it really has to do with this interdisciplinary nature of the program that I just referred to. But the point is that the stakeholders come in at the beginning of the program. So city government, companies, are engaged with the students from the very beginning. So, what, so their needs are addressed through the students uh, uh, pursuing their education program. And at the end of the game, many of these students are immediately hired because the stakeholders, the companies and the agencies know that they can deliver to their needs. So I think the business model is an important piece of how you achieve urban uh, sort of education uh, uh, to be uh, a success. So, um, talking about uh, uh, our approach, and again, this is not necessarily only our approach, uh, but I think if we were to think about it as um, sort of the informatics um, uh, point of view, there's really two separate pieces of information that needs to be looked at. There's all the stuff about sensors and information coming and going and all of that. And then there's the stuff that has to do with administration has to do with people, has to do with their income, has to do with their age, has to do with their, uh, you know, where they came from, the education, has to do with the function of the government. So, so those we call organic or administrative data. And so the question is, if one was to take first principles, and what I mean by first principle is, when you think about this, you're talking about public policy, you're talking about finance, you're talking about humanities. When you look at here, perhaps you can think about physics and chemistry and spectroscopy <laughs> and all that other stuff that, that you at Intech clearly cover both areas. And so using some of the first principles, then what does it take for us to really gain deeper understanding of cities? And what does it take for us to take that to the next level? And so ultimately the idea is to have some sort of an information platform by which decision making can be done, by, by which policy makers can be convinced, by which people can buy into some of the changes that is being proposed by the government. So I'd like to uh, show this really busy slide uh, and, and I, uh, I, I, I don't want to attempt uh, uh, doing zoom in with, with, the, with the computer, but I just want to show you this sort of data structure of New York City government, okay? And, and the reason I'm showing this is because it is a success and it's a good model uh, for information sharing in cities. Um, here's uh, what we call the data bridge, uh, which is all the information. All the I'm sorry? All the administration. Yes. Absolutely. As a matter of fact, uh, as a matter of fact, their circles, I'm sorry that it's not showing up, circles are agencies. Uh, Department of Health, Department of Transportation, Department of Fire Department, Department of Finance, and so on and so forth. The circles are departments, so approximately 11, uh, in this case it's showing more because of some other extra agencies, but approximately 11 uh, agencies. The squares are offices within that agency, okay? So the various offices, meaning the squares, feed information to the central, central headquarters, and then that information comes to the data bridge. So literally, the entire information about the operation of the city of New York is available for our students to work with, with the stakeholders. This is the important point, right? with the stakeholders. So that means not only I'm referring to um, the city agency, but also the commercial entities who are interested in creating business in the city. Okay, so I think that's an important piece about the stakeholder engagement. So uh, having said that, I'm just gonna kind of run through some of the slides, and I'm sorry for some of the repeats if you've seen some of these uh, on Wednesday. Um, but I think on the organic data side, uh, the importance of uh, 
information about people is really essential. Uh, and this is an interesting uh, slide, and I'll just refer to one spot here. So the right side shows uh, uh, wealth, all right, distribution of wealth, uh, basically uh, annual income ranging from 10,000 to 250,000 per year, okay, annual income. And you see that, of course, there's some uh, high income people uh, around here and a little bit here, but mostly here. And this is uh, just uh, for those of you who may not be familiar, just in case I refer to it, this is the city of New York and there are five boroughs the Manhattan and the Brooklyn and the Queens and the Bronx and the Staten Island. Manhattan is sort of the, the headquarter of <laughs> the finance and so on and so forth. On the right side, on the left side is age, okay, median age. And you see that uh, clearly there's some older people here, older people, older people, younger people, younger people. But what I'd like to refer to here is take a look here. This is high income and very young. Huh? Very young, high income. This is a new thing. This did not happen 20 years ago. This happened only in the past 10 years. Okay, yeah, it only happened in the past 10 years. And so when you look at this, you, you, you start kind of gaining some, the availability of this information allows you to uh, take on studies that you would not obviously otherwise do. Uh, uh, let me just uh, kind of complement that by showing you what is known as the green taxi data. Not the yellow taxi. Yellow taxi is what most people know about in New York, let's say. Uh, a yellow taxi operate in Manhattan. You see, you don't see any pickup in Manhattan because a yellow taxi is, uh, 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 is I'm showing you green taxi. Green taxi can only pick up outside of Manhattan, not inside. So you see that you're picking up here. There's a border of the, the uh, regional border of the Manhattan border. And, then, and here is that, like, that young and rich crowd that we were referring to. Pick up from the young and rich crowd being dropped off in. So this is incidentally a, 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 a homework from uh, the class that I just referred to. So students kind of play around a little bit with this. Uh, they work with the Taxi and Limousine Commission uh, in this case, which is uh, one of the, uh, which is head of the Taxi and Limousine Commission is, is the body that, that, that handles uh, the operations um, of, of, of the thing. So they are one of the customers, for example. The Taxi and Limousine Commission is a quasi-private institution that is one of the stakeholders uh, working with the students. The students have a capstone project at the end of their one-year program. It's a one-year program. And each of those capstones has to have a stakeholder engaged addressing their needs for that capstone progress to be approved. So this is, not, this is, this is taken very seriously, the stakeholder engagement. So, um, and, and, and in a way, I, I suppose you can call this a blueprint of what we're doing. So that, that is essentially what I'm conveying to you. Um, so going further now on, on information about sort of people's engagement, data about people and so on and so forth, this is mostly about people's engagement. Um, in, in, uh, in New York uh, and, and all New York, all city, US cities are probably, I don't know, in, in, in Santo Domingo if there is a, a non-emergency call number emergency call number in the US is 911 and here as well. I don't know if there is a non-emergency call in, in, there is one in there, okay. So this is a non-emergency call. This was launched in, in 2003, in the more than 10 years ago. Uh, it receives approximately 50,000 calls every day, uh, 3, 000, over 3,000 different topics, and in 180 different languages. Okay. So it is indeed people-centric. This is, <laughs> this is really delivering a product, delivering a service to the people. And frankly, people have people use it. And here is an example of the 311 calls referring to sewer backup. Sewer backups in the street, not in the home. Because when, when the uh, water uh, um, drainage system in the city does not work, it backs up into the streets. Here is uh, the, the, this distribution of calls that I should have probably made these. This is, again, one of the uh, homeworks from the students. They should have made the dots a little smaller so you can see better the density distribution. But if you look at the heat map, you can better see most calls here and here and here, all right? Now, uh, this is over 50,000 calls, okay? So now if I come now and look at street flooding again, and so the thing is that you can now look at this with respect to precipitation values. You can look at age of the infrastructure. You can look at maintenance, uh, maintenance of the system. So it's, 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 a, it's an interesting, this kind of information cannot be provided through sensors. Well, it can if you have a brand new system like 
whatever new city you design, but for a city like New York, it's, uh, the system is too old for, for it to instrument it, to provide you this level of information. So, 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 it's, so it's really uh, an extraordinary opportunity to, to, to have people engaged. Um, information about buildings, so now, that, now that we're on the, the, the building in the remaining nine minutes that I have, I'll try to speed up a little bit here. So full information about buildings, commercial, residential, height, occupancy, age, materials, and so on and so forth, and how that can be used in order to look at energy consumption. Here's um, one week of energy use in New York City, okay? Uh, one week, Monday through Friday, and these lines are uh, eight, uh, power consumption of, diff of 82 different networks, okay? Uh, New York City is chopped up into 82 different power networks, these are low, low residential consuming. These are high commercial uh, consuming. And you see that there are times where the peak power is reached and all of a sudden you see, bang, this drop. That drop is an agreement between the power company and the high consuming co commercial entities that have high air conditioning loads. And so they've made an agreement that when you things start getting critical, they turn off called on-demand reduction, which is a mechanism to prevent blackouts. So again, this is a, uh, a, a project that the students are working on with the power company. So I can understand that it's not easy to set this up, but I think it's a worthwhile effort to look towards setting up a, a, a platform like this. My final um, uh, piece on uh, sort of the administrative side of the things uh, uh, has to do with waste, and I, and I hear that you are all very serious about uh, waste management here and rightly so because it's a big problem uh, and perhaps the reason the municipality is paying attention to this because it is a, a pain point for the municipality. It's a, it's, a, it's a critical area of concern for the municipality. Here's 10 years of information, 10 years of data on waste in New York City. New York City generates 20 million pounds of garbage every day. Uh, when we divide this by 10 million people, it's about what you generate here in Santo Domingo. In Santo Domingo, uh, also, we did a little calculation. You generate approximately two pounds per person per day, okay? And that's pretty much what New York generates. So you see that there are seasonal variations. The, the summertime is higher, winter is lower, summer is high. There are some fluctuations, sort of high frequency fluctuations that are largely due to the weather events. It's really not a really consumption, it's a weather event. And so, globally speaking, there's been a slight reduction in waste, but not a lot in 10 years. Mm -hmm. And so, when you look at the recycling down here, I won't spend too much time on it, we recycle approximately 17% of our waste, okay? Now, 30% of this waste uh, is compostable, it's food waste, okay? And I know that there's some efforts here that in Santo Domingo as well dealing with, with food waste. And so there's a lot of really, really interesting work in, 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 in terms of food to energy. And uh, Professor Gonzalez will, will, will speak a little bit about our, our efforts in New York City on, on carbon uh, footprint reduction, and, I, and I'm sure you'll find it very interesting. But the point is that when you find uh, that level of information uh, on, a, on, on a, not only the temporal, but also spatial, then perhaps you can gain better understanding of effect of education on waste generation, effect of uh, income on waste generation, messaging through schools and so on and so forth. This work, by the way, is published in Journal of Waste Management uh, 2017 for anybody who's uh, interested in uh, pursuing it further six minutes left. Um, so um, I'd like to switch a bit now uh, into sort of where is it that the research front is, um, is, is trying to contribute. Uh, and again, these are student research that, that I'm referring to. Here's uh, looking at Manhattan, um, uh, thermal imaging of Manhattan, uh, basically shows surface temperature, uh, looking from New Jersey across Manhattan. Um, and um, clearly some buildings are losing a lot of energy, some are not. Um, uh, and um, this information then can, y you know, having that information and having the available information from City of New York, so this is open data from New York City, looking at the topography, the topology of, of the infrastructure in New York, some really, really interesting models can be created. And, and this is the kinds of information that's another, having the surface temperature allows then in-depth understanding and in-depth modeling. So Professor Gonzalez will also show you some of the work of, of, uh, that, he, that he will show you with respect to modeling. And so uh, the, the boundary, one of the if, if important boundaries for that modeling of a city scale is the surface temperature. 
So this work was actually published recently in, uh, in Nature uh, Scientific Report in uh, 2018 of this year, so February. If anybody's interested, the much of the data that I'm, I've used in this uh, is open, so you can certainly feel free to, to use it if you, if you wish. Um, uh, on the same level, if now, for those of you who are in the chemistry, and there's, if, if now looks at, one looks at the, the, high, the thermal uh, wavelengths, except in multiple wavelengths, uh, what we'll do, basically do spectroscopy, where every pixel, if you go into the pixel you're doing spectroscopy, you can then start looking at the variety of emissions from the city, and here this is one particular uh, piece of emission. This is a, a, a refrigeration gases. This is uh, known as Freon. For those of you who are, who are familiar with, uh, with that sort of thing, these are Freon gases. Um, this was also published in Nature uh, in 2017 uh, uh, sub, uh, under that title. Again, the access, open access uh, uh, article available to you. Um, finally, and the last um, uh, four minutes that I have uh, uh, in, in the presentation, um, this is some work that was done with the New York City uh, uh, Department of Health and Mental Hygiene because it's the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene in New York that is really responsible for quantifying uh, emissions in, in, in New York City. The Department of Environmental Protection is responsible for enforcing laws and regulations, okay? And New York City, uh, this by the way is just uh, some uh, showing maps of uh, different kinds of pollutants. The point is really not necessarily what the distribution is right now, but the point I would like to make, and I mentioned this also on Wednesday, so apologies for the repeat, that 10 years ago, uh, the sulfur dioxide qu quantities in New York City was out of compliance. It was so high that the federal government put New York City on the list of out of compliance cities. So we were really forced to do something about it. Department of Health and Mental Hygiene carried out the study, uh, found that the heavy fuel oil was responsible for the high emissions of sulfur dioxide, and it took approximately six years for the Department of the Environmental Protection to enforce banning of those fuel oils. At the moment, sulfur dioxide concentration in New York City is undetectable. So we're going from out of compliance to undetectable. And I consider that a success story for, uh, I, mean, I was not involved in that, uh, this is a new study posted, but I, I certainly consider that a, a, an agency success, uh, if, if I may say so. Um, so, um, uh, and my last uh, uh, sort of research angle uh, piece here is, um, what does it take now to add people into the game? Hmm? To add people into the game. Here, here's a, an example again, one week of, of uh, data uh, at one subway station in New York City, okay? So what I'm showing here is the blue uh, shows you the number of people passing by one location. This is by pinging the cell phones as they pass by, okay? So we know how many people are going by, okay? Number of people. The uh, line here is the pollution uh, at that location. So when you multiply these two by each other, you kind of get what you, you call the burden of disease at that location. So now, if one then can find this for every location, at least for many locations, then you start really being able to quantify the human impact of emissions. And, and that's a piece of work that uh, Department of Health and Mental Hygiene is carrying on with our students. Again, that's another project that Department of Health and Mental Hygiene is working as a capstone with the students. <laughs> so um, this work, by the way, um, is also published in IEEE Journal of IoT in 2018. Uh, but, um, September. Finally, um, uh, wrapping up uh, with with a with a, a nightlight image of, of your beautiful country, um, uh, you know, showing uh, Santo Domingo where we are right now, and uh, of course you're at the San Diego, and then some of the smaller entities here, and um, and and uh, as a matter of fact, um, uh, you know. Gonzalez and I were speaking last night of, of you know what what can be a contribution, how how can we uh, contribute and in a, in a way I think Santo Domingo is uh, um, you know uh, the Dominican Republic uh, in, in general I mean, in tech of course as perhaps as, as, as an entity that has taken on this challenge uh, can certainly play a huge role I, I mean I would say if, if it was my recommendation I would say start at the country scale and then move on to a regional uh, scale sort of taking on the leadership of how you you, you know create uh, create uh, uh, opportunities through studies of cities 
uh, opportunities through the stakeholder engagement, opportunities through bringing education and the stakeholders together uh, in order uh, sort of pursue this field that uh, clearly is, 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 uh, is on uh, your, uh, your global agenda. Um, looks like I'm 50 seconds uh, behind schedule, uh, so Eileen, I can turn it over to you. Uh, appreciate that. So thank you very much, um, Jess and uh, Masood, for your um, interesting presentations. Um, I think we will go um, to a session of questions now uh, from the audience. Um, so um, I, will, I will moderate this um, in English, but the questions from the audience can be in Spanish, of course, and we will translate. Um, so um, I would like to start with uh, with Jess, um, I think um, your presentation was really interesting in the sense, um, as you have shown us the importance to involve political leadership um, into the development of our cities, right? And especially the part of capacity building um, for political leaders in the public sector and, and to have dedicated leadership in our urban projects. Um, so, um, I, I had a question um, during seeing your presentation, since we with the Cities Lab, we are working a lot in the whole region. We are working a lot with the public sector and especially capacity building in the public sector. And um, a reality we got confronted with a lot is um, the project, uh, the problem of continuity um, in, um <laughs> in Latin America especially, right? So. Um, the, the, like the problem to have more sustainable projects in the long term, since um, in general we have elections every four year and um, the local government got uh, get, uh, changed completely and it's, it's hard to have long term sustainable projects in that sense. So what's your experience um, on that topic? Can you tell us a bit about it? Yeah, I think that's an excellent question because we also struggle with that in the States because we depend so much on elected leaders. In most US cities, we have a, what's called a strong mayor form of government. So the mayor is the CEO of the city, can hire and fire the planning director, the economic development director, everyone. Um, in smaller cities in the US, there tends to be a different structure called a city manager form of government, where a city manager who is hired by the city council is the CEO. And that's a little bit less political because the city manager likely stays through many mayors. If the mayor changes at an election, the city manager is a bureaucrat who stays for longer, in many cases, times. But in cities like the big cities in the US, New York, and others where there's a strong mayor, an election can dramatically change the direction of the city. And so it's hard to keep a project over that transition. A couple of examples that I've seen recently be successful in the city of Boston, um, Tom Menino was the mayor for 20 years, I think. A long, they have no term limits, so he was mayor for a long time. And when he finally decided to not run again and there was a new mayor, that's a potential for a huge transition for a big city. And one of his goals towards the state of his term was about improving sustainability. Boston, you can imagine in your head, is on the waterfront, on the coast. It has a lot of port and inland land so really vulnerable to climate change. The maps that show with just a few inches of sea level rise, Boston, you know, huge sections of land might be underwater in Boston. So climate change is a big priority, sustainability is a big priority. In the last year of the Menino administration, he formed what was called the Mayor's Green Ribbon Commission as a committee of the 40, I think 45 largest, the CEOs of the 45 largest employers in the city of Boston including uh, nonprofits and institutions like the universities, but the CEOs of hospitals, major employers. And for the committee meetings, only the CEO could come. The CEO could not send the vice president or a, you know, a representative. If the CEO can't come to the meeting, your company is not represented at the meeting. And the com commission only met every other month or something. So CEOs would cancel their travel plans for their company to be at that meeting because it was the mayor calling the meeting they wanted to be there, it was their chance also to network with the other CEOs in Boston. But the focus of their work was about sustainability. And so they had task forces on 
you know, water, energy, waste reduction, all the aspects of sustainability, and then the whole commission would meet every two months to push the agenda forward. And what that meant is because the Green Ribbon Commission was meeting for a year and had this network built around sustainability, this is what the CEOs are coming together to discuss, then when the mayoral transition happened, you had a very powerful stakeholder group that was, stake, you know, sustainability is their number one issue. So when the new mayor gets elected, new mayor takes office, all the CEOs in town of the large employers say, okay, and here's our agenda in the Green Ribbon Commission. How are you gonna help us implement this? So that helped the new administration have the, the power behind it of very important stakeholders that were committed to the project and the agenda of sustainability. So I think that's the kind of example that can help smooth out the transition. Very interesting example. Um, I'm just thinking, I'm from Vienna. Um, we just had um, the first time in my life a new mayor. He was mayor for actually 26 years, so, <laughs> wow. Um, so, uh, Masood, um, I think um, your presentation showed very well the importance to um, involve academic research into urban development projects, right? And to collaborate with the academic sector for the generation and analysis. Um, of data. Um, during your presentation um, and you have shown us like the, the big um, amount of data that exists for example for New York City, right? Um, but what I was questioning, we work a lot in a region where we have uh, very often areas where we work with no data or very outdated numbers um, and really a lack of data. What kind of methodologies um, do you use um, in these cases and in these territories um, for your work? I would say that um, it's that's part of the process, right? So if you if 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 uh, the there is a, a lower level of maturity, and, and I'm I'm and I'm using the the word maturity not in a derogatory way, uh, maturity from a, a sort of evolutionary way, right? Of 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 uh, sort of availability of information. That it is what it is. And so what does it take to start from that point? And what kinds of uh, conversations, what kind of collaborations, what kinds of partnerships can you create so that all parties are benefiting? And if you, if you can develop that business model by which all parties are benefiting, I have a feeling that you soon can get to where maybe whatever all these other cities are from a data availability point of view. But data availability is only one thing. Uh, I mean, the will to kind of create a space uh, that results in progress is the first piece. And that leadership is at the center of it. Okay, uh, thank you, Masood. Um, are there any more questions to Masood or to Jess? Um, Dr. Masu, this is a question from um, newspaper El Caribe and from your national circulation. And we would like to know um, from your like experience in you know in the urban science, um, how can you like identify the issues to have a sustainable city like here in Santo Domingo? Like the issues that like traffic jam, like like that kind of problems um, in the May Day. Yeah, I mean, certainly traffic, uh, traffic is, is definitely one issue. Um, look, it's, um, I, I, I don't think my answer in terms uh, specifically uh, is going to be of much contribution uh, on, uh, if, if I try to give specific technical sort of uh, guidelines and all those kind of things. Uh, in my opinion, partnerships is key. If there is strong enough partnership and commitment to making Santo Domingo, uh, I mean, it's a beautiful city as it is, but even a better place. 
if there is that, and if you can develop a business plan by which everyone wins, if the private sector wins, if the academia wins, if the government wins, then I think it will emerge. Where did my friend go? I think it will come out. It will appear. Because technology is there. Traffic science, traffic studies, traffic engineering, all of that network analysis is available. Um, alternative energy is available. The, it's, it's, it's really how do you finance progress? Government can play a huge role in, in, in creating those partnerships. Everybody wants to be around the table with the government. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, just, yeah, I just agree. I think the mayor in particular, the, the title of the power lends some credibility. The mayor can convene a meeting differently than anyone else. Um, you know, the university presidents, the major CEOs will come to the table for an invitation from the mayor, and it's important to use to leverage that leadership in the city. Okay. Uh, I think. So, what it is is that uh, <clears throat> there is a global conversation, the Paris Protocol, Paris Accords, and all those. Then there's a national conversation. You know, what is the government? Want, and there's a local conversation. And they may not necessarily, this may not be a progressive pro, you know, uh, transition. I'll give you a US example. Federal government doesn't care about necessarily at the moment about all this climate stuff and about the greenhouse stuff, about all of that, right? But the local government is sort of connected to the global conversation. So uh, you ha one has to figure out at what scale do you want to make that connection. Perfect. Um, I saw uh, two more questions, three more questions, and I think then we have to. Bien, gracias por esta oportunidad. Eh, como sabemos, eh, el fenómeno de emisiones de gases de invernadero se ha enfocado más bien en el, en el área de climatológico que está relacionado con el cambio climático. En otros países, sobre todo, se ha hecho pocas investigaciones de la incidencia que tiene las emisiones con las enfermedades, con la con salud. Más bien, se, ha, se han hecho investigaciones en países desarrollados. Usted puso un ejemplo de Nueva York. Eh, evidentemente, por condición de nuestro país, que es un país desarrollado, no tenemos investigaciones de estas emisiones con relación a la salud humana. Yo soy miembro de la Academia de Ciencias de la República Dominicana. Nosotros estamos interesados de manera especial en hacer estudios sobre los problemas que crean las emisiones de gases invernaderos en la salud humana. Usted ha hablado de, de colaboración. Nosotros queremos que usted nos oriente a ver cómo nosotros podemos eh, eh, recibir alguna cooperación a través de la, de, de, del organismo que usted representa para nosotros encaminarnos a hacer unas investigaciones sobre emisiones en la ciudad de Santo Domingo, porque todavía no se ha hecho, nosotros no conocemos. Así que esa es la pregunta, si ustedes pueden orientarnos, asesorarnos para nosotros emprender ese tipo de investigaciones, porque aquí se están produciendo muchas enfermedades como consecuencia de los residuos sólidos, la contaminación de, los, de, los, de las aguas de los ríos y sobre todo las emisiones que hacen las industrias, lo que hacen, que hacen las plantas eléctricas y que hacen también eh, los vehículos de motor. Gracias. Gracias por la pregunta. Um, did the translation uh, work? I'm sorry, I, I, she gave me a brief. I wasn't, I didn't know I was supposed to. Um, so to sum it up, the question was about um, um, urban health um, issues, right? And um, if there is um, no or few data available and few research available about urban health issues and how um, environmental um, pollution uh, influences um, urban health um, of the population. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I mean. Um, 
Uh, so Anna, so the question was, what was the question? I see. So, you know, I mean the the um, the um, and maybe you can translate afterwards. Okay. Or no, he has the translator. Yeah, okay. they they will. Try. Okay. Um, They're professionals. They're professionals. <laughs> <laughs> Unlike us. Yeah, exactly. Um, so you know, um, in my opinion, the thing to do would be to start establishing the framework such that the country, the Dominican Republic, Santo Domingo government, whichever, is creating that space by which the information you're looking for becomes available. So in other words, a homegrown uh, initiative, grassroots initiative, right? And that's where institutions perhaps like in tech can come in um, you know, creating the space by which that framework can be developed, uh, whether it's information collection, whether it's information sharing, whether it's information analysis, and so on and so forth. And so everybody has to be involved. The hospitals have to be involved. The, the government, the city government has to be involved. You know, so it's, it's an it's a entire community that's engaged in this. It's, it's a big thing. And, and, and the final point I'd like to make on this is that Students really like this because it hits home. It's about their parents, it's about their fathers and mothers and their brothers and sisters and about themselves. They really like this sort of thing. So how do you bring science into making life better? Students really like that. Yeah, I'll just add, I think that's really important that the health component also can help make an argument to a new audience about why sustainability is important because now do you have doctors all of a sudden becoming com you know, advocates for clean air, clean water, because they see the, the disease impacts when you have that kind of data. And another project I'll just mention, um, in Puerto Rico, uh, in the Caño Martin Peña, outside of San Juan, along the estuary, there was, an, and I say this, I'm a, a proud American, but um, I, I don't love everything about my country, and one thing I'm particularly ashamed of is the way that we treat Puerto Rico like a colony. Um, and so uh, outside of San Juan, in the Caño Martin Peña, there's an informal sediment of 75,000 people living on self-built housing with no infrastructure. And as it grew to 75,000 people with no infrastructure, of course, the, the human waste and everything was just going directly into the estuary of the Caño Martin Peña. So incredible pollution. And it took a crisis level of pollution of the main waterway leading into the city of San Juan before it got the attention of our national government, which has immense resources in the Environmental Protection Agency. But not until it reached that crisis did they declare this as an environmental disaster and put real resources to it. Even then, once it was sort of declared a disaster, it took a long time in bureaucratic terms for the money to be delivered for a local-based solution. But now what they're doing is it's amazing work. There's a nonprofit in Lasse um, which was formed there to form a community land trust because none of the challenge was none of the people own the title to their land, right? It's informal settlement, so self built housing. So they need to be moved to build proper infrastructure, but no one has title, so everyone is insecure about moving. So they formed a land trust and gave everyone who lived there a title to a share of the land trust. And then they had a huge planning process, totally participatory, okay. to plan the segment, segment. So they would move one section at a time to rebuild that section with proper infrastructure and then those families could move back. And then they said, okay, what section we sh should we build next? And everyone voted, and then everyone voted on the, the plan for moving families out, you know, out and moving back. So it was totally participatory because it was locally based. So it takes that level of partnership too, between sort of the national government and the local government to deliver a solution that works on the ground too. One uh, quick uh, follow up to that. So clearly, uh, from what I see, uh, you know, you all have uh, um, interest and a commitment to, you know, making, uh, you know, making things better uh, and creating the space by which all of this progress can be accomplished. So the question is, uh, and this is something actually that Prof. Gonzalez and I were speaking about last night, is that how does it take, what does it take for Santo Domingo to play a regional role of leadership? So, right, because then, then that, then the business case becomes even more pronounced. How can you play a regional role in the Caribbean and the, north, uh, the northern part, part, part of uh, South, uh, South America uh, such that you can justify the investment it takes to accomplish what the stuff we're just speaking about? 
Thank you. Um, y yo sé que hay muchas preguntas más, yo vi uh, varias, porque las temáticas son sumamente interesantes, um, pero tenemos que cenar porque el café nos está esperando. Entonces, lo que yo propongo es que... As, exactamente, que Chess y Mahut van a estar con nosotros um, todo el día. Entonces, ahí en el café que les hagan sus preguntas y ahora... Um, hacemos una última más, so one last question um, para, para cerrar. Um, entonces la pregunta que yo vi, que era la próxima, era del señor. Acá. Soy Jesús Joaquín Gómez, eh, pertenezco a la Asociación Tecnológica de Investigación y Desarrollo Empresarial. Hablando de retos y desde la sostenibilidad de desarrollo territorial, ¿Cómo se involucran con los objetivos del milenio donde los gobiernos a nivel mundial han hecho un compromiso? ¿Y cómo ustedes ven y cómo se muestra las capacidades que ustedes ofrecen de orientación de acuerdo a la configuración geográfica de cada ciudad o país? Um, interesting question. Uh, it's a really relevant one in the U.S. right now because, of course, our current um, government, national government, has said that they are no longer going to stay in the Paris Accord Agreement. Um, so that's complicated. But there has recently been a big group of mayors, um, several hundred mayors of cities, that formed a new coalition. Uh, and there's a, non a bunch of new investment behind it from Michael Bloomberg, um, who just committed $75 million dollars to these cities to help them meet their sustainability goals. And the, the tagline for it is, we're still in. So we as a city, the city of San Francisco, the city of Boston, the city of Raleigh, North Carolina, small cities, big cities, Chicago, are still in the agreement, even though our national government isn't. So I think that there's lots of levels that leadership can come from. And right now we're in a moment where that kind of thing is happening at the city government level, not at the national government in the US. Um, so, um, I mean, I think the, again, the blueprints for how to accomplish some of those goals are to some extent um, available. Uh, the, what it takes, it, but it's a big job. It's, it's a big lift. And so it takes planning and it takes patience. And it takes, you know, so, you know, you start, and you slowly build, and then at the end of the game, it's done, you've built it. And so, you know, it takes investment, it takes commitment, and I think, in my opinion, having the partnerships that create that investment and the commitment, uh, it, when that is formed, and one can figure out what does it take to form that, as a matter of fact, one can convene uh, that space for, for these uh, stakeholders to come together, then the technological pieces can then be brought together. Perfect. Uh, thank you very much, um, Chas and Masood. Um, bueno, queremos darle las gracias al Dr. Gandehari y a las arquitectas Jessica Zimbabwe y Tamara Eger. Eh, también queremos aprovechar este momento del break para saludar la presencia del señor Alejandro Mosta, Montaz, director de la Corporación de, de Acueducto y Acuartarillado de Santo Domingo. Gracias por acompañarnos. Y a la señora Altagracia Tavares, directora ejecutiva de FEDOMO. En este momento vamos a hacer un receso, unos 15 minutos. El refrigerio está servido en la plazoleta principal y les agradecemos regresar puntualmente a las 11 para iniciar con el primer panel. Muchas gracias. Gracias.